panel. So welcome to module six, capital allowance. Now, when it comes to taxation and fiscal policy, one of the key topics that you have to be uh, familiar with because it is very fundamental to businesses is the concept of capital allowance. Now, you see, when we are determining the tax of uh, companies, as we saw, uh, as we will see later on in corporate uh, tax liabilities, you realize that the tax authority does not consider depreciation. Why? Because the tax authority sees that depreciation is a non-cash item and that uh, the depreciation policy of the company is different from uh, how much that we have to all give them for tax purposes. So, for tax purposes, when we are determining the tax liabilities of a business entity, we do not take into consideration what depreciation, which means that after we, are, we get the profit for the year, we're going to be adding backwards the depreciation, then we subtract the capital allowance. So capital allowance is a very key area, very fundamental to the subject of taxation and fiscal policy. And what we want to do in this module is to go through a couple of things that we need to understand. How capital allowance is given, the conditions under which capital allowance is given, how we can calculate the capital allowance for various classes of assets, how we can deal with capital allowance with transactions when we are having commercial vehicles, dealing with capital allowance when we are looking at disposal of assets and that disposal is resulting into a, a loss or a resulting into a gain. How do we deal with a capital allowance in relation to these assets? So that is what we want to cover right in this module. So my objective here is two. So at the end of this module, you should be able to explain and understand the concept of capital allowance. Very, very important. So you should be able to explain and understand the concept of capital allowance. In addition to that also, you should be able to compute capital allowance for various scenarios and uh, assets. You should be able to compute the capital allowance for various scenarios and assets. So what is capital allowance? When we say capital allowance, what is it? Capital allowance usually it's just a, a benefit, okay, that is given, a reduction that is given. So it is granted. So we say that capital allowances are granted to taxpayers who employ depreciable assets to their depreciable assets in their businesses. They are also granted to provide some measure of relief for the capital expenditure incurred in the business period. So what is capital allowance? It is simply a, re a relief that is given to business entities for the capital expenditure incurred for the basis period. So if for the period we buy, we are a school and we are a limited liability company by shares, and if we are a limited liability company by shares during the basis period, which is the year of the period under consideration, if we bought some cameras, it's a fixed asset, we bought some computers for the business, we bought some other assets for the business, at the end of the year, we're going to charge depreciation. But for tax purposes, we are not going to include depreciation. So in order to give us a relief for the capital expenditure that we incur for the period, the tax authority gives what? The capital allowance. So the capital allowance is a relief that is given to uh, entities who employ uh, who employ uh, chargeable or depreciable assets in the period, all right, in the period. That is very, very important. Now, the capital allowance granted normally depends on the nature of the asset and then the sector the asset is being used. So usually the way capital allowance is granted is dependent on the nature of assets, which we're going to be looking at in a moment about the various classes of assets and even the industry in which that the asset is used. Because um, uh, an asset used in an industry is going to be calculated different from an asset used in another industry. That is the capital allowance on it, which means that uh, an earth moving uh, asset that is used by a mining company is going to be certainly different. Uh, calculation of depreciation is going to be different from if that asset is bought by uh, another company which is not really intended for mining purposes but for other earth moving purposes. So, depending on the sector that we are in and then the nature of the asset, capital allowance will be granted in that respect. 
But the big question we need to ask ourselves is, what are the circumstances under which the general, the Ghana Revenue Authority can grant capital allowance? Can everybody just get up and say, oh, I'm claiming capital allowance? Can everybody just get up and go to the office and say, I'm, I'm a business? So this year, the capital, the, the expenditure in care is 5,000, so I'm claiming a tax for uh, capital allowance of 10%. Can anybody really go? The answer is no. So what are the circumstances under which capital allowance can be granted? Or what are the conditions necessary to be met in order for capital allowance to be granted uh, to businesses? The first one is that capital allowance are granted with respect to depreciable assets of a capital nature. Very, very important. So that's the first the thing, circumstance. So they are granted to depre on depreciable assets, okay? On depreciable assets of capital nature, which means that, you know, when it comes to expenditure by businesses, we have the recurrent or the revenue expenditure, and then we have the capital expenditure. So the revenue expenditure is the expenditure we incur on the day-to-day -day administration of the business, but the capital expenditure is the expenditure which, which whose benefits goes beyond one accounting year, and so it's about acquisition of assets and uh, other uh, property plans and equipment. So we have to, before we can uh, go for, to the tax uh, authority to be able to claim capital allowance, we have to ask ourselves, this asset on which we are going to claim capital allowance, is it a depreciable asset and is it of a capital nature? Very, very important. Now, as you will know later on, I'll talk about it, you cannot claim capital allowance on food real. All right. So if you buy a company and then uh, the company is worth, let's say, five million dollars, that is the net asset of the company. But you bought the company for seven point five million dollars, meaning that you are paying an extra amount of money. And as you know already in corporate reporting, that is called goodwill, two point five million. Now you cannot go to the tax authority and say that I paid two point five million or more when I was buying this business. So that is goodwill, so I'm going to claim a capital allowance on it. No, goodwill is not a depreciable asset, and hence, you cannot claim capital allowance on goodwill. So before we can claim capital allowance, the first condition, the first circumstance under which capital allowance is granted is that it is granted on depreciable assets uh, in capital or of capital nature. The second one. Capital allowance, uh, allowances are granted in respect of depreciable assets owned by the person making the claims. This is also the second one that is very important. So it has to be a depreciable asset in capital nature. But the second one is that it has to be owned by the person making the claims. What does that mean? It means that if we are claiming capital allowance for premium education have limited, then the assets on which we are claiming the capital allowance should be owned by us. In other words, if someone gives you a gift, like for instance, you did not, you don't own the assets, but you use it in your business, then you can't claim capital allowance on the asset. Why? Because you don't own the assets. So if, for instance, I come and I borrow your, uh, your maybe you have a, a, a camera, then uh, uh, and I come and borrow the camera with some laptops because I have, I have a problem with mine and so I come and borrow yours and I use it for a given period of time and even I pay you I cannot go to the register the, to the tax authority and say that I am claiming capital allowance on that camera why because I don't own that camera that camera is not in my name I did not buy that camera so ownership is the second circumstances under which we are, we can give what capital allowance. So it has to be a depreciable asset of a capital nature. Two, it has to be owned by the one making the claim. Three, the asset should be used in the generation or production of the income of the person. The asset should be used in the production of the income of the person. So the asset on which we are claiming capital allowance should be used in our business in production or in generating our revenue. What does that mean? It means if we buy an asset 
and that asset is not used to generate income for us, and that asset is possibly used by the CEO then uh, for his personal uh, uh, rants, for his personal things, that means we cannot claim capital allowance on that asset. Why? Because that asset is not used in the production or in the generation of revenue. However, if we buy a vehicle for our selling and distribution department, and they use that vehicle to go and sell goods, to go and visit clients, to go and make deliveries, that means that that asset, we own it, and we are using it in the generation of our revenue. As such, we can now go and claim capital allowance. So not only must it be a depreciable asset of a capital nature, not only must we be the people owning the asset before we make the claim, but the third thing also is that we have to be the people who are using the assets and the asset is generating income for us or we use it in the production of our goods or service. Four, the Commissioner General should be informed of the purchase and putting the assets into use within one month. So when we buy an asset, we need to inform the Commissioner General that, hey, we have acquired a new asset. We have acquired a new asset in our book so that they know that we have an asset. So when it is time for us to claim capital allowance, they know we own the asset. So that is the fourth thing we have to do. We have to inform the Commissioner General one month after the asset is purchased and being put to use so that we can claim capital allowance on the assets. The fifth thing here there is, it must be in the business in the last business year of operation except in temporary disuse. What does that mean? It means that the assets must be in active use for the basis period. If it is going to be, it, if it is not going to be in active use, it just has to be of uh, an inactive use for a temporary period. What it means is that for the basis period, if we have 12 months, it means we are using the assets for each of the 12 months. If there is any break, then maybe one month can be allowed. Maybe there, there, there was something, we, we had a problem with our raw materials, so raw materials were not coming in, or we had a problem with our sales team, so our sales people were not going out. So within that short period, yes, the asset was not being used, but yes, we can still claim capital allowance. But the condition is that the asset has to be active and being used in the day-to-day -day running of the company. That is the fifth thing you need to understand. Then, the sixth thing is, it must be acquired at a cost. It must be acquired at a cost, right? So the asset must be acquired at a cost. So if I come to your company and I give you a, a gift, maybe I buy you a four by four, or maybe I buy you uh, yeah, a four by four, we will look at non-commercial vehicles later on. But let's say I buy you 4x4. Four four. The law states that only about 75000 that can be allowed for capital allowance purposes. And we'll get into that in a moment. But if I buy you a 4x4 four four and I give it to your company, that is a gift. You did not acquire it at any cost. What the act is saying, that what the law is saying is that because you did not acquire it at a cost, you are not supposed to uh, 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 claim any capital allowance. Because if you go back to the definition of capital allowance, we said that it is a relief granted okay, on depreciable assets which are what? Of a capital nature. Right? So you spend some money to acquire the asset. Hence, we are giving you that relief. So these are some of the six things that you need to understand when we talk about the circumstances or conditions that must be met prior to the giving or to the granting of capital allowances. Very, very important. Now, when it comes to determination of how much capital allowance has to be uh, calculated, then the way it goes or it is done is to... Uh, Put the assets in a pool of uh, in a pool, right? So 
all the assets of the business are put in a pool. So we have five pools of assets and we call it class of assets. Right, so we have class one, class two, class three, class four, and class five. Now, it is very important for you to know the assets in every class so that when you know when you come to questions, you will know that okay, this is a class two asset and this is the rate of capital allowance, this is a class three asset and this is the rate of capital allowance, or this is a class five asset, this is the rate and then the method of capital allowance because it is very important. For you to understand that in relation to that so five classes of assets let's go through them quickly so let me rub that off my back we're gonna have class one class two class three class four and then class five then their rates of capital allowance are respectively given as this is 40 percent 30 percent 20 percent 10 percent and this is also 10 percent or you can use the economic useful life of the assets so these are the five classes of assets class one the rate is 40%, class 2, 30%, class 3, 20%, class 4, 10%, class 5, 10% or using the economic useful life of the assets. Now, so when it comes to these classes of assets also, the method that is used in uh, calculating the uh, capital allowance, it's different for them. The assets from class 1 to class 3, uh, the capital allowance computed on them are on the reducing balance basis. So very important. Then the class 4 and class 5 assets are on the straight line basis. Very important. Very important. So it means that uh, when we are dealing with class 1, class 2, class 3 assets, we're going to go with the reducing balance method, which means less amount of capital allowance will be calculated as and when the assets elapse. But then with four and five, the same amount of capital allowance will be calculated over the economic useful life of the assets. These are very core things you need to understand. Class one assets, 40%, class two assets, 30%, class three assets, 20%, class four assets, 10%, class five assets, 10% or they're using the economic useful life of the assets. Now, when it comes to class one, two, and three assets, we use the reducing balance method. When we come to the class three and four uh, uh, assets, we use the straight line basis. The straight line basis. Now, so what are the assets, or what are the examples of some of the assets in each class? So you have the list in your ebook there. So I hope you have downloaded your ebook already because if you're in this module, it means that you have downloaded the ebook already. So in your ebook, if you check it out, I'm just going to go through some of the list of the assets there. I may not cover all of them, but as and when we go ahead, we'll be able to identify some of them as and when we go ahead. So class one assets usually are computers and data handling equipment. That's it. So class one assets deals with computers and data handling equipment. So anything about IT, computer, software, anything, data handling equipment, VR, everything about that, it's going to be a class one asset. So when you read a question and you hear something like, the company acquired a new accounting software, the company bought a new computer, the company bought a new uh, uh, IT uh, system or does something, whatever equipment that relates to IT, that relates to data handling, that relates to computing, goes to the class one pool of assets and the capital allowance will be calculated at a rate of 40% on the reducing balance method. Class two assets uh, is a bit, a, bit, a bit bulky area. This is where we have automobiles, buses, mini buses, construction and earth moving equipment, trailers and trailer mounted containers, plant and equipment used in manufacturing, assets resulting from expenses relating to timber, 
consents or large scale rabbits, oil, palm or other long term crop plantation. So these are a list, okay, gazillion list of uh, assets in the class 2 pool of assets. So plant and equipment using manufacturing company, buses, motor vehicles, all of these things fall under uh, the class 2 assets. And as I mentioned, as we go ahead in solving the questions, you will be able to identify this is a class 2 asset, this is a class 3 asset, this is a class 1 asset, and you'll be able to go through it in relation to that. The next thing is the class 3 assets. Class 3 assets, example of some of the class 3 assets include the following. Railroad cars, locomotives and equipment, vessels, badges, tanks, and similar water transportation equipment, aircraft, specialized public utility plants, equipment, machinery, office equipment, and fixtures, and any other depreciable assets not included in other class. Bam. So here, things such as office equipment, okay, things such as office equipment. So it's more or less like things we use for administrative purposes are classified under the class 3 uh, assets, all right? And we have some uh, other things also for locomotives, movement of things from here and there. The class 4 assets are normally assets of permanent nature. So class 4 assets are building, structures and similar similar works of permanent nature. So building, when we build a factory, bam, it's a class 4 asset. When we uh, uh, build uh, an office uh, facility, it, it's that. So anything of a capital nature, remember, we are going to be looking at it. Did I say of a capital nature? Of a permanent nature, we are going to be looking at it under class 4 assets and remember that is 10% and we're going to be always doing it on the cost which is the straight line method. Then certainly the last one class 5 assets relates to intangible assets and if you have done IAS 36, you've done IAS 38, you know how intangible assets are or what intangible assets are IAS 38. So all intangible assets will fall here. Now remember, goodwill is an intangible asset but it is not an acquired intangible asset, okay? We did not, yes, it is an acquired intangible asset but it is not a depreciable intangible asset. So we are talking about depreciable intangible assets here that are acquired at a cost, all right, or intangible assets that are amortizable, okay, that loss that, that will lose their value as and when they go up. So, with intangible assets, it is 10% on the cost, or if we know the economic useful life of the asset, then we use that as the basis in order to calculate the capital allowance. Now, if you remember IAS 38 intangible assets, you remember that when it comes to amortization of intangible assets, we need to determine whether they have an, a definite useful life or an indefinite useful life. And it will mention that if the intangible asset has a definite useful life, then the amortization is going to be the cost of the intangible asset divided by the economic useful life so that we will get the annual charge for the amortization of the intangible assets. But we said that if the asset does not have, or the intangible asset does not have a definite useful life, then we cannot calculate amortization, but rather it has to be carried at fair value, meaning that once every year we test whether the, it has suffered impairment or not. So it is the same idea that is reflected here. If we know the useful life of the intangible asset, then capital allowance will be calculated using the economic useful life of the intangible asset. But if we don't know the economic useful life of the intangible asset, certainly it is going to be 10% of the cost which is 10% on the cost, and that is also going to be on the straight line basis. So these are the five classes of assets, what we call the pool of assets, and these are how we're going to be dealing with them. One to three on reducing balance method, three, four, and five on a straight line method. One, two, three, four, five rates are 40, 30, 20, 10, 10, respectively in that order. So these are the things that you need to understand. But it is very important for you to note how we actually calculate capital allowance. How is capital allowance actually calculated? 
So there is always going to be this formula that you're going to be using when we are calculating capital allowance, all right? And so let me rub this up. So we say that capital, now I'm going to use the, the, let, this, uh, the initial CA for capital allowance during the course, all right? So when I talk about CA in this module on capital allowance, I'm referring to capital allowance, okay? So CA, it's going to be, we use the formula A times B times C all over 365 very very important this formula is going to form the basis for us in calculating capital allowance now why is this important it is this is the fundamental formula so whether you are dealing with full basis year or less than the number of year in the basis year this formula is going to be fundamental for you to be able to calculate the capital allowance but let's explain the variables here quickly a simply is the value of the assets in the pool. So the value of the assets in the pool, that is A. B simply has to do with the rate applicable. So if it is a class 1 asset, we know the rate applicable is 40%. If it is a class 2 asset, we know that if the rate applicable is 30%, class 3, 20% in that order. So the rates applicable, applicable to the pool. That's the second thing. And then C there is for the number of days in the basis. The number of days in the basis period. The number of days in the basis period. So when we talk about the number of days, what does that mean? You see, over 360. 360 is a full year. Okay, so the year of assessment is always going to be 365 days. But when we are calculating capital allowance, sometimes it is going to be that the basis period is less than 365 days. So if the basis period is less than 365 days, then we need to find out the date of acquisition of the asset to the end of the year and find out how many days are there and use those number of days in order to calculate what? Our capital allowance. Please note, this formula is going to be fundamental in everything that you're going to be doing in capital allowance. If you miss this formula up and you don't understand it and you don't use it, that means that you're going to be hectic or you're going to have the challenges when you are calculating capital allowance. So CA equals A times B times C divided by 365. A is the value of the asset in the pool. B is the rate applicable and certainly C is the number of days in the basis period. Is the number of days in the basis period. So these are what you need to understand in relation to that. Now, before I begin solving questions with you in relation to capital allowance, there are all uh, some other rules that I want to remind you on. Some of them I've already said them, but some of them also I'm here to say them. And I'm going to explain this rule. And it is very important for you to understand these basic and important rules when dealing with capital allowance. Number one, the base rule or condition for the grants of capital allowance. So I've already said that the conditions or the circumstances under which capital allowance is granted, that is very important. We went through the six conditions that must be there before capital allowance can be what? Granted. Can you remember some of them? List them and let me let me see. Pause the video if it is possible and list them down. Just try to remember them. Don't refer to your notes. Try to remember them. We mentioned that it has to be a depreciable asset. We mentioned that it has to be used in the generating of our income. We mentioned that it has to be owned by the company. We mentioned that it has to be used during the basis period and the discussion. We mentioned also that it has to be acquired in a cost. And I think we mentioned also that it has to be, uh, I forgot in the set one, 
you can remember the set one, right? So you can refer and get the set one. So the first rule, the rules or conditions for the grant of capital allowance, very, very important. The second thing you don't have to forget is the features of the pooling system. Not forgetting the treatment of additional income and additional capital allowance in determining the chargeable income of a business. Now, we will get into this one in a moment when we start solving the questions. I, I, I. Goodwill as an intangible asset no longer qualified for capital allowance. And I've explained why goodwill is not qualified for capital allowance. Why? Because goodwill is not a depreciable asset. So even though we pay the money, even though it is a capital expenditure, even though we were the one who paid it, even though it occurred during the basis period, even though the goodwill belongs to us, we cannot grant capital allowance or we cannot claim capital allowance and be granted capital allowance because goodwill is not a depreciable asset. Keep that in your head. Very important. Fourth, capital allowance computation is purely based on the basis period. Ending, ending within a particular year of assessment. So it is always going to be within the basis period, which is ending on the, uh, on the year of assessment. So if our year ended is 31st October, of 31st October, and we acquire an asset in March, that means that our capital allowance calculation is going to be between March, 1st March to 31st August. Uh, October. That is what we mean by the number of days in the basis period that the asset was used or the asset was acquired. Very important. You don't want to mix that. Continuing on that, the date of acquisition and disposal is to be determined in, in which the year of assessment of the asset is to be added or subtracted to the pool. So about depreciation or additional additions to the pool of assets, how is it going to be supposed to be treated? When we start solving the questions, you will get the answers to all of that as well. Number five, note that if the vehicle is not a commercial vehicle, the restricted figure to put in the class two pool is 75,000. Otherwise, there should be no restriction on the figure. Very, very important. So, if it is a vehicle, and the vehicle is not a vehicle that we use in our business, but it's a vehicle, for instance, we bought for the CEO, and he uses it for business purposes, for capital allowance purposes, if the vehicle is 300,000 Ghana cities, we must reduce it and only recognize 75,000 Ghana cities in the book in the book. So these are non-commercial vehicles. So non-commercial vehicles for capital allowance purposes, irrespective of the amount given, it has to be, sorry, if the amount is huge, it has to be reduced to what? 75,000. And usually, a vehicle for non-commercial purposes are always expensive. So some are 30,000, some are 50,000, some are 1 million, some are 1.5 million. So depending on the currency we are standing at, whatever it is, it has to be reduced to only 75,000 Ghana cities and put into the class 2 pool of assets. And we are going to do that in relation to that. So that's the fifth thing you don't want to mix. Number six. The capital portion of a finance lease now qualifies for capital allowance in the books of the lessee. The capital allowance is not calculated on operating lease since it constitutes a rental expenses in the books of the lessee. So capital, we can claim capital allowance on what? Leased assets. Okay, so when we lease assets and it's a capital lease, it means that uh, that, and that is what is going to be done under IFRS 16, previously known as IES 17, where risks and rewards has been transferred. We are the people maintaining the assets, doing everything on the assets, and every revenue on the assets, we enjoy that, we enjoy majority percentage of the, uh, our higher percentage, about 90%, substantially all of the revenue comes to us then we can claim capital allowance on that lease expenditure. But if it's a normal rental, then we don't qualify for any capital allowance. Seven, private assets does not qualify for capital allowance computation. Certainly, certainly. If the asset is not for the business, it's for the, it's for the CEO. If the asset is not in the name of the business, 
or it is used for private purposes, then it is not for business purposes. Because one of the conditions uh, that we mentioned is that, uh, uh, is that the assets should be used in the generation or production of the uh, goods and services of the company. So if the asset is used for other purposes or private purposes as, aside the company's core objective or the company's core activities, then these are referred to as private assets and so they don't qualify for capital allowance. The seventh thing is land assets does not qualify for capital allowance computation since land appreciates in value except for wasting land. So we don't claim capital allowance on land, all right? The building we can claim capital allowance on, but the land we cannot claim capital allowance on because land appreciates in value, all right? Land appreciates in value. So that is the eighth thing. The ninth thing is capital allowance should still be calculated during a tax holiday. Very, very important. Now, we will look at this later on in the course. But you see, like for instance, uh, Apostle Suffolk's uh, automobile has been given, I think, 10 years tax holiday by the current government. So what it means is that during the tax holiday, because you are not going to be paying any tax, you are not supposed to claim any capital allowance. However, the Act requires that you should still be calculating your capital allowance. You should still be calculating. Why do we have to do this? This is known as notional capital allowance. So you are calculating, but you are not claiming. So it is known as capital allowance. Why do we do this? The essence is to determine the written down value to be carried forward during the tax period by the end of the tax holiday. So that after the tax holiday, when you now begin to pay tax, we know the written down value of the assets that will be carried forward into the period where you are going to start to pay tax. So during the tax holiday, the entity has to still be calculating or computing capital allowance and that is known as the notional capital allowance. Now the purpose of that is that we will be able to know the written down value of the assets that will be carried forward after the tax holiday in relation to that. So these are the nine important things that you have to note about capital allowance. Very, very important. You don't have to miss that in relation to that. Usually, the main reason why this formula is used is when the basis period is less than 12 months, right? It's less than 365 days. So if the basis period for the computation of the capital allowance under discussion is below three, uh, 12 months, then we use the formula so that we will know the number of days in the basis period that the asset was used so that we can calculate the capital allowance on the asset. So these are the various discussions, theories, and things that you need to understand about capital allowance. I hope the concepts were okay. I hope you were able to familiarize yourself with the various things that you need to understand. I hope that you were able to also understand the conditions and then the importance of the various uh, rates that we're going to be using. Now, what we want to do now is to get serious, be practical, and solve some real questions. So we want to begin with some real questions and find out how we can actually compute the capital allowance in various scenarios, okay, in various scenarios. So I'm going to go through a number of questions that I have here. I'm going to go through as much questions as I can in, in order to make sure that you understand the concept and you'll be able to do it in relation to that. So let's get our first question in your kids. So, first question in your kit. So, let's go with that. Um, Roberto Limited started business on 1st January 2016, preparing accounts to 31st December each year. So, be, be careful here. So, date of commencement of business is 1st January. So, we started business on 1st January 2016, and then the year ended, very important, it's also 31st December 2016. So we prepare 
or the financial the, the, the financial statement is prepared on 31st December 2016. So that is the 12 month period. That is the first thing you need to identify. The company acquired the following assets. The company acquired the following assets. Five computers on 1st January 2016 valued at 20,000. The company purchased an additional computer on 20th November 2017 at the cost of 4,000 Ghana cities. Required. Calculate capital allowance for 2016 and 2017 year of assessment. So if you check this question out, you realize that it's about computers. And computers belong to which class of assets? That's right, class 1 assets. And what is the rate of calculating the depreciation or the capital allowance on it? Bam, 40%. And what method do we use in computing capital allowance on class 1 assets? That's it, the reducing balance method, right? Very important. So, how do we now calculate the capital allowance for the two years under discussion, the 2016 year, and then 2017 year of assessment? So first, we're going to do year of assessment 2016. So in 2016 year of assessment, remember the basis period, our basis period here, now, I'm going to be using BP for basis period, so if I use BP, note that I'm referring to basis period. So the basis period is going to be what? The first Jane, which I listed there, 2016 to 31st December 2016. So that is the basis period for the company. This is the period for the company, and that is a 12-month period. Now, so since this is a 12-month period, we really don't need to use the formula, but we can still use the formula so that our CA capital allowance, remember it is A, the value of the assets, times B, times C, all over 365. So for the year 2016, what is the value of the asset? Remember we said A was the value of the pool. We were told that I'm tempted to use dollars, forgetting that I'm in Ghana, you know. So in 2016, on February 2016, we bought an asset for $20,000. So A is $20,000. B is going to be what? The rate we used, and as we've mentioned it, is 40%. And C is going to be the number of days in the basis period. Now, as you can see from January to December, that is going to be 365 days. So really, this is a full year transaction, so we don't need the formula, but we're still going to go use it anyway, just to let you know how it goes by. So by 40%, by 365, all divided by 365, and that is going to give us an answer of something around 8,000 Ghana cities. Make sure I have that here. 8,000 Ghana cities. So the capital allowance... It's 8,000 Ghana cities. But this is not really what the examiner asked us to do, right? We wanted to calculate the capital allowance. So what the examiner really wants us to do is to be able to calculate the uh, capital allowance for the two years. So this is the capital allowance for 2016. But we need to do a professional presentation. As I always tell you, professional presentation is very important when you are writing the exam. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to put a year of assessments here. And the first thing is 2016. And with 2016, you know that it is 1st Jane to 31st Dees 2016. And we're going to pull our currency sign up here. Then the value of the asset, remember this is a class 2 asset, so you might want to just put it up there to tell the examiner that you know, sorry, class 1 asset to tell the examiner that you know. So the value of the assets 2016 was 20,000. Then our CA, so we're going to less the capital allowance, and we calculated it as 8,000. So when we subtract it, the written down value carry forward. It's going to be 12,000. So at the end of 
uh, the year that is 2016, the written down value of the asset is what, 12,000. Now remember, why are we interested in the written down value? Because with a class one asset, we need to use what? The reducing balance method. So when we go to the year 2017, so 2017, 2017 is also going to be 1st June to 31st December 2016. The same idea. But we're going to bring this carry forward. So written down value, this should be V, brought forward is going to be this on the reducing balance method, right? Now, th that is also going to be a full year. So if it is going to be a full year, but remember, in 2017 we were told, so we go back to the question. The company purchased an additional computer on 20th November 2017. 2017, sorry, on 20th of November 2017 at 4,000. So you see, once there is a pool of assets already, any assets that we buy is added to the pool and we calculate depreciation on the net uh, value of the pool of the assets, all right? So that is very important. Now, I think I'm using the word depreciation and capital allowance interchangeably, but you should understand that when I say depreciation, I don't really mean depreciation, as you know, according to IAS 16, I mean, when I say depreciation allowable, I mean capital allowance, and we're talking about tax. You got it? So let's go. So, the addition during the year, so we just add it, irrespective of when it was acquired, once it is within the year, we add it up, and that is 4,000. So when we add it up, we're going to get our depreciation basis, that is the value we're going to be using or value 16,000. So this 16,000 now we need to calculate what? Our capital allowance. So we're going to let CA and that's going to be 40% of 16,000. Okay? 40% of 16,000. So 40% of 16,000 that's going to give me 6,000 400. So when we less that, the written down value carried forward is going to be 9,600. So this is how we compute the capital allowance for an asset. As you can see, it's very sweet, right? Straight to the point. Now don't tell me, eh, Inshira, in the exam hall, the question will be some way. No, 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 no. It is fundamentals. When you get the fundamentals right, Boom, you are ready to go. When you get the foundations right, boom, you are ready to go. So this is the solution to that question there in relation to that. So that is the first thing. So you realize that in this question, this is what I want you to identify. In this question, you realize that we bought the assets, then the following year, an asset was, brought, was bought. Now, when an asset was bought in the following year, we just added it to the pool of the assets and then we calculated depreciation on the total. This is very important. This is very important. So you make sure that you have an understanding of that very, very well. Okay, so that's question one. So let's look at the second question and this is about disposal of assets. So in the first question, sorry, in the first question, we dealt with addition of assets into a pool. But in the second question now, we want to look at what happens if during the year we dispose of an asset. How is it treated? Very, very important. Now all of these small, small questions before we're going to take the giant question, I just want to illustrate to you how capital allowance is treated by piece by piece. Sorry, piece by piece. So that once we put the pieces together in the real question, you will be able to cope with it. Very important. So question two is about disposal of assets. So I hope you know what to do. You pause the video and you write, right? So I can jump over to something else. So, question two, this is disposal of assets.
So what if during a basis period we dispose of an asset? How should we treat it? How will it be treated? What, how do we go about it? Now,